Do you see that nail shaper? That machine they usually use in the nails parlor or even in salons to shape your nails. There is a section that usually come into contact with your with their nails. That thing has to be cleaned and disinfected. The reason for that is because here online I've seen people attending to clients with a fungal infection under their nails and they're going to use that drill bit. Is it a drill bit? What do you call that thing? That, that, that section, the end section. So that thing has to be cleaned and disinfected because I've also come across people who've allegedly acquired a fungal infection under their nails from a nails parlor. So it makes sense that you need to really take care of that thing. That thing has to be disinfected all the time. And if you come across someone with issues and especially an infection under their nails, you don't need to attend to them. I know it can be tempting to get their money, but let them just go see a dermatologist first and then they come back when they've taken care of their fungal infection. Can risk factor cause autism? <laughs> Before you even go further, your DNA controls everything directly and indirectly using the genes. So your genes can make you normal, very normal, and they can also mess you up. But it's not all the time. We also have epigenetics. Mm. My mom is O positive. Yeah, and my dad is, my dad was O negative. So the erasers factor and later she shida. That one is quite incorrect because it's only when the mother is resource negative and they have a partner who is resource positive that they should be worried about hemolytic disease of the newborn and not autism. Okay, you might argue that the fight between the mother and the child might lead to brain developmental issues. Now you'll have to understand one thing. HDN mostly affect the first bonds because after sensitization, getting a second pregnancy going to term might be very hard. And uh, you might say, hey, blood is everywhere. So that fight might be taken to the brains. Now in the brains, there is a blood brain barrier. What usually happens is there is exchange of material between the blood and CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, which will take over and circulate the, you know, nutrition and everything in the brain. So blood will never get to the brains. So it was nothing about genetics. Uh-huh. This is anti-D. This is what is injected to resource negative markers when they conceive to prevent sensitization so that they are not going to form antibodies that will fight off the antigen that is in the baby that is carrying resus positive blood cells. Before you speculate why she might be normal, Mom, you didn't actually get it right here because you don't provide blood to the fetus. No, it develops its own blood during development. There is something called embryology. And for the speculation why she might be normal, after listening to the whole story, I came up with the two conclusions. And let's start with what we know. One, we have autism here. We have autism. And then we have the causes. One can be genetical genetical or environment. We put them in the same basket, environment. Don't mind about my handwriting. On this other side, we have our claims here. There is a factor. There is no relationship between autism and the blood group. There is not even a single study suggesting that there is any relationship between these two. What there can be is a relationship between autism and genetical predisposition or environment. And you know this too, we can start mentioning epigenetics, but that's a topic for another day. But here we have a link between these two. Genetically, let's assume there is a gene which has not been proven yet, meaning that we are only speculating because we have a relationship between autism and genetics. And to make it easier for us to understand my argument here, let's assume there is a gene involved somewhere. So for you to get that gene, we, we have something we call allele. So we have two pairs each, meaning that you're going to get one from the mother and another one from the father. Let's assume this is our mom. And from the story, you can see we have dad one and we have dad two. This is the mother. From the story, let's assume that number one is normal. So here, every kid is normal. We also have our Amina here because I, I, I'm confused. I don't know whether she falls in dad number one or dad number two. From dad number two, here we have autism. We also might have Amina here and others that are very normal. From dad number two, this is the combination we do have here. Remember, we are still speculating scientifically. So we go to the mother. The only combination that can give you this will be the mother is a carrier 
that's A. And the dad here is also a carrier for autism because we're, we're talking about at least. So this is dominant, this is not. And this is the combination that you're going to get. If you remember, here you're going to get someone who is normal. Here you're going to get a carrier. Here you're going to get someone who is also a carrier. And here you're going to get someone who is autistic fully fully autistic so this combination is making sense for this but i'm not saying it's genetical from all that the scientific information we have as of may 2025 autism blood group and resource no link autism and genetics environment and try to squeeze epigenetics somewhere in there there is a link i'm happy because in the u.s they've put resources together to investigate the causes of autism very soon we might have an answer to this, but currently nothing to do with your blood group at all. This is Ken Salt, a Kenyan staple. If you look at the side here, it's written for the Kenyan market only. And I came across a very interesting conversation where they were putting all manners of conspiracies. So I decided to come and clear those up. Now this is for the Kenyan market only because it's iodated edible table salt, meaning that we have iodine in here. And it has been standardized for the Kenyan market based on the Kenyan population. If you go to South Africa, you're going to find that they have different levels or different requirements. You might find that they don't even require iodine in the salt. I'm just saying. Meaning that if this brand will have to maybe export to South Africa, they'll have to make another batch that will meet the requirements as per South African cabs. In Kenya, we have cabs that requires that we have iodine here and they have set the levels that, that are required in each and every maybe gram of salt. So that's exactly the reason why this is for the Kenyan market. If they so happen to meet South African standards, they are going to write here for South African market. Or maybe if they are going to export this to Europe, they will just have to meet the requirements there and then they are going to specify that because each and every country usually have different levels we might have similar in eastern africa but it's not guaranteed so our cabs here have set the amount of iodine that is required in here the cabs will have set another requirement so that's the reason why this is for the kenyan market and the reason has to do with taxes and i'm so poor when it comes to taxes so i'll wait for someone who understand them better to tell us exactly why this is for the Kenyan market only based on the tax and those stuff. Still on cancelled, by now you understand the reason why this is for the Kenyan market only. And this is based on the amount of iodine we do have here. It's a standardized for the Kenyan population. And I got so many questions about why can't we just have one figure for each and every person on this planet? Why can't we just have just something which is cross-cutting? Now that would be hard. And this is because before they came up with the amount of iodine we require, in this salt for the Kenyan population, they did an assessment. This is not the only source of iodine. We have that also in other foods, but when they evaluated the food that we do have in Kenya, it doesn't provide you with enough iodine for your body. And that's a risk because you might develop greater. And that's why they fortified this with iodine uh, based on the risk assessment that they did. That's why we have that amount here. Now, if you take this all to another community, let's say in an island that totally rely on, um, let's say, seafood. Seafood is a rich source of iodine. And if you so happen to give them the levels that you do have here, you might give them excess. And that's also a bad thing. Low amount, bad. High amount, bad. So you'll have to standardize this based on the amount of iodine in the circulation that, that's in the food that they're taking. That's when you fortify based on the requirements. So we cannot have a cross-cutting figure for each and every person. It will be hard. So you'll have to evaluate that based on the population that you're serving. This is salt, normal salt you usually use in your dishes. This is a banana. I'm using this to represent the fruits. In the salt, we have two things which are very toxic to your body. We have sodium, which is very reactive to water. Your body is made up of water. I'm sure you remember from chemistry, it can even explode. We also have chlorine, which is very dangerous, actually even burnt in chemical warfare because it's very toxic. Now, those two things, you combine them, they become so stable and so good to a point your body cannot exist without this compound. Let's go to the fruit. Here we have so many things. Let's pick several, like the ones that are easily picked out. We have fractals. We can have potassium here, but you're not going to talk about potassium. Let's talk about fractals. You go to this fruit, you remove the fractals part, then you concentrate that that's processing. It becomes something different and that's why people are suffering from sugar. So the sugar you're going to take from here and then process out there is different from the food matrix where that sugar is existing in here. The same thing will happen when you take sodium out of this and you purify it. It's going to be very toxic to your body and it's not going to be safe for you. So why then take fractals out of this food matrix and then judge the whole fruit based on only that? 
if you cannot do the same for the salt. And the same stupid thought can be applied to the fish. You have mercury in there, but does that mean that I'm not going to take the fish and benefit from them? You know, the fats that usually get there just because there is some tiny bits of mercury in there. No. Anyway, uh, continue taking fruits and especially whole. They are more healthy when you take them whole because there is a food matrix going on here. And when you pick a component out of here and then you purify that and then you use it, you are taking apart what you're provided for by the nature. So try to eat as, you know, closer to the nature as possible. Because if you remember from the seed dispersal, the tree is bribing you with the fruit so that you can help spread the seeds to other places. So that tree is going to do everything possible to make it safe for you so that you come back tomorrow because it also minds about the future. And for the poisonous fruits, it's because you're not the target audience for the fruit. They say breakfast is one of the most useless meals in a day. But is it? Now, let's pick an example. One of my favorite examples because I've worked in a construction zone at some point in my life. Life changes. Now, you see, let's say, let's assume that you are putting the slab that day. So you will have to wake up early in the morning. And by the time you're getting there, there is that trailer which is bringing in cements and you'll have to offload that. Are they 50 kg bags? And you'll have to offload that. You and your friends, you'll have to offload it and then put it in the store. So you need energy for that. And then you'll have, you know what usually happen in a construction zone. So I can have an idea, like he said. You see, uh, that person might not clearly understand what you mean by saying that you don't require that morning breakfast meal, even a heavy meal. Actually, you find even someone cooking ugali in the morning and they're going to be very healthy. You know why? Because that's what the body is demanding for. If you're working in a place where you really need to use your energy, your physical energy, you need to use a lot of energy, you need to take advantage of any portion you get during the day, including that early in the morning. But if you're working, let's say, somewhere in an office, you're seated somewhere, then even maybe a fruit can be a lot of it. Maybe you can then skip a meal a day or maybe you can just take only one meal in a day and just grabbing a fruit and then going to work can be sufficient for you. But if that guy who's offloading that trailer happened to just grab only a fruit and then go to work, they might not survive through. So food is quite personal. You need to know what usually take you throughout the day. Don't listen to people here online telling you that you don't need to eat something in the morning. You know what you need to do because you know what you usually do. If you tell someone who's working in a construction zone that they don't need that or someone usually have a sand somewhere down there in Kitui that they don't need it, then you are misleading them. Na watu wachache sana hawawezi kuambukizwa virusi vya ukimwi. Hili ni kundi ambalo ni nadra sana kukutana na watu hawa. Hawa watu wana genetic resistance ambayo inasababisha kuleta ugumu kwa huyu HIV kujiattach kwenye seli. Hii inasababisha watu hawa waweze kumfukuza au kumfanya mdudu huyo asiwe na mamlaka ndani ya miili yao. Hivyo mwisho wa siku wanakuwa hawaoneshi dalili na wanapona kabisa ugonjwa huu. Watu hawa ni everything all the way up to this point correct but then this is where he makes a very huge mistake which is people with blood group form are the one that will have this mutation where they cannot get hiv which is totally incorrect because hiv will get into your system through white blood cells not the red blood cells so your blood group will never matter now for hiv to get into your system it requires three things one a white blood cell to the one that has a CD4 receptor and a core receptor. Now we have people in the population with a mutation such that they don't have CCR5 or CXCR4, meaning that HIV cannot get into their system. Again, blood group does not matter here because we are dealing with white blood cells. Everyone has that. So everyone has a chance that they might be resistant to HIV. Now, there was a study which was looking into the cure of HIV. That is this guy who had uh, leukemia and he required a transplant, that's bone marrow transplants. And the researchers were like, how about we look for, you know, bone marrow from someone with this mutation? And that's what they did. They got bone marrow from someone with that mutation. They implanted in that person with leukemia. And apparently that person also had HIV. And eventually that person got cured of HIV. Although he later on died because of complications as a result of leukemia, not from HIV, meaning this is a possible cure. But this is not tied to any blood group. It's, it can be anyone. And it's very hard for you to know if you have that mutation. And for the few that we do know, that was just by a mere chance. Meaning that you will still have to keep, take care of yourself out there. Because it's out there. And it's not a nice thing.